Good morning. Um, hello, everyone out in Zoom world. I'm Brooke Kamen, Rappaport Deputy Director and Martin Friedman, Chief Curator of Madison Square Park Conservancy here in New York. It's a pleasure to welcome you this morning for a conversation moderated by Helen Stoilis uh, with art journalists Fong Bui, Mira Dayal, Philip Kennicott, and Phyllis Tuckman. If you have a question or comment or want to let us know where you're signing in from um, at any time during the presentation, please type that into the chat function. There will be a Q&A at the end of the program and your questions will be addressed then. Um, thank you to my colleagues Dana Klein and Truth Mary Cole for their efforts on these programs. Madison Square Park Conservancy commissions visionary artists to realize public art on a seven acre site. The adaptability and need for urban civic space has only heightened across this long year, confirming a park's role for artists and students, families and communities, protesters, workers and neighbors. We are now 13 months out from the beginning of pandemic lockdown, uh, from the loss of 564,292 lives from the coronavirus just in this country. The country is reeling from relentless killings of black citizens and last week of the shooting of 13 year old Adam Toledo in Chicago a mass killing in Indianapolis and anti-Asian American hate crimes. During these brutal months, citizen artists have brought work into the streets of our cities and parks and onto historic monuments. Artists have adapted to isolation in the studio, museum and gallery exhibitions have gone online. And now with the vaccine progressing, we can access those spaces in real life again. Um, and throughout, art journalists have been frontline interpreters of this period. We've studied their ideas through critical reviews and features. I'm looking forward to hearing from our speakers about this period of plague and protest and how works of art have persisted in so many ways and in learning about the essential question um, if this time has demanded change in their work. Today, we welcome distinguished art writers to discuss the challenges and fortitude of this long year. Their longer bios are going to be included in the chat feature. Uh, Fang Bui is co-founder, publisher, and artistic director of the monthly journal, The Brooklyn Rail, and its imprint, Rail Editions. Since March 2020, The Rail has hosted almost 300 daily lunchtime conversations with artists, writers, filmmakers, and poets in what I call the heartbeat of consciousness. Mira Dayal is an artist and critic based in New York. She recently joined Art in America as ideas editor and is also co-organizer of the residency program rehearsal, co-curator of the collaborative artist publication Prompt, founding editor of the Journal of Art Criticism and a regular contributor to Art Forum where she was previously associate editor. Philip. Kennicott is senior art and architecture critic at the Washington Post. He has been on staff at the Post since 1999, first as classical music critic, then as culture critic. In 2011, he combined art and architecture into a beat that's focused on everything visual in the nation's capital. In 2013, he received journalism's highest honor, the Pulitzer Prize for his criticism. Phyllis Tuckman is a longtime art critic and art historian. She has published and posted articles, reviews, and interviews for Art Forum, The Brooklyn Rail, Town and Country, Smithsonian, The New York Times, Newsday, Art News, and Artnet. And Helen Stoilis, our moderator, is editor Americas at the Art Newspaper, where she manages a team of staff and freelance writers across the U.S., Canada, South America, um, who contribute breaking and investigative news for print and online. An amazing lineup of brilliance um, and thought leaders. Thank you all for being here today. Um, and now on to you, Helen. Thank you, Brooke. Um, that is a very kind introduction. Um, and I want to say I really love the, um, the title of this series, This Long Year. Um, like any good headline, it really gets right to it because what a long year it has been um, and an eventful one, um, which for us journalists and writers is both a blessing and a curse. 
Um, I think we can all remember points in the past year where we suddenly realized, wait a minute, it's only been a week since that last crazy thing happened. Um, so a year ago today, the coronavirus pandemic was at its height. We had just broken the grim record of a thousand deaths a day in New York City. Um, cities across the world were locked down. People were scared. A month later, George Floyd would die in Minneapolis, his body pressed to the ground with the police officer's knee on his neck for nine minutes. The country soon erupted in protests as people shouted to make clear that enough black lives had been lost. A tense election turned into an ugly view of what happens um, when lies and ego-driven denial are allowed to run rampant um, and a dangerous wave of conspiracy theorists and embittered white nationalists stormed the US Capitol. And that brings us into 2021. Um, we thankfully have a vaccine and efforts to make it available to more people are starting to expand. Businesses are starting to open. Lives are starting to look a little something like normal if you squint. Um, but in some ways we're still stuck where we always have been as Brooke mentioned um, as well, you know, as the shooting in, in uh, Toledo, we had Dante Wright was killed in Minnesota this month when a police officer somehow mistook a gun for a taser and QAnon will just not go away. Um, so we're here today to look back on some of this and I hope also to look forward to see where we go from here. Um, and I wanted to kind of start off with a question that's uh, open to all of us, but I'd like to gear it to you, Fong, first. Um, what are some of the biggest challenges you faced as a writer and as an editor over the past year? And how did you adapt um, you know, with, with the challenge of uh, putting out a publication as publisher of, of Book of Rail, but also kind of making sure that you were connecting to your audiences? What, what were the kind of things that you had to figure out over the past year and how did you figure that out? Well, um, a good friend of mine, uh, right under the pen name Hakim Bay, he published a very beautiful book called Taz. I think it's 92, which stands for Temporary Autonomous Zone. It's something that appealed to me in the sense that I grew up in Vietnam. When my family escaped Vietnam, which is basically escaped the tyranny of the Communist Party there, we came here in 1980 in Bucks County, Pennsylvania. So you can imagine <laughs> the kind of racial discrimination we face in the suburb. Uh, so ultimately coming to New York, I never forgot the urgency of how you would walk and think as Hannah Arendt's recent book is called Thinking Without the Bannister. It's essentially when artists and creative thinkers and artists and all kind of individual of that ilk are, are capable of thinking of that similar way. You know, not that different than John Kitt's term, uh, negative capability. You know, you, you act upon the impulse that reflect your surrounding. When I grew up, there was a Vietnamese proverb that I always remember and appreciate. It says, when you live in a long tube, be thin. If you live in the barrel, be round. So it's not that different from Toni Morrison, beautiful phrase also, when she emphatically said that when you surrender to the wind, you can ride it. So to me, you know, this whole entire election of Donald Trump uh, on January 20th, 2017, I remember clearly the following month Timothy Snyder published a book is called On Tyranny, the lesson from the 20th century. So I read it in one sitting, in one, an hour and a half. I think Timothy Snyder intended to publish that book with great urgency. Uh, it's the way in which that everyone can read it clearly, uh, essentially dictating the whole, um, you know, fear of fascism, the rise of fascism, of Nazism, the way that he did it was so urgent and I think the timely manner. Um, I love his term when he spoke of politics of eternity. 
the idea of amplifying the nostalgic past and suppressing, you know, suppressing facts of the future. And it was a very interesting timing for me because that very weekend when March, uh, you know, 16, um, when the pandemic hit, hit, when Trump came on television, it was 3.30 p.m. and announcing 15 day quarantine. And uh, most of us probably knew that he didn't even know what that term meant, where it came from, you know? Uh, but he also had the bombacity to deploy the term that we all detested so much, which is social distancing. To me, that is extremely manipulative. It could have been physical distancing, but definitely not. It has to be social. It's a way to amplify fear, dividing people from one another, um, anxiety, uncertainty, all of that, which very much... Uh, very much a reminiscence to what Karl Kraus spoke of Hitler when Hitler rose to power in 1934. You know, when he said that the, the secret of the demigod is to make himself as stupid as his audience, so they think they are as clever as he. So something that I'm very sensitive to. Uh, so in order to react on the spot, so to speak, this is a term that I always feel indebted to my late friend and Philip's late friend, Irvin Sandler, who felt like the only time that you really understand art history, he's referring to artists, is to be there in their studio. Him or her, they, that's how you learn art history on the spot. You know, it's not an intellectual practice which you can consume through multitude of books that you read and you're not able to remember anything because nothing hits you with the heart, with the gut feeling, you know? So on the spot was important for me that very day, around six o'clock, we were already working from home. I call a meeting with my staff and fortunately we have a board member named Jeremy Zilar, who have worked for Obama initiative, trying to support government worker to be sped up with technology. Mm -hmm. So we sat down, we have a, a, that meeting and I inquire about Zoom, what is Zoom? You know, how does that work? And I remember basically telling my staff that I once have a, a dinner, uh, like maybe a month and a half after September 11 with my dear friend, the late great painter, Leon Gallup, the only artist that I ever met in, 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 in US, in New York, that really knew uh, very specifically every combat episode ever happened during the Vietnam War, which was basically his work. He remembered specific names of general, field marshal, you know, police chief of North and South Vietnam. So he and I was great friends. And basically we sat down, have a dinner. And I told to Leon that I was very impressed by Al Qaeda people, yeah. how they manage with six or seven on foot in Manhattan. And they were able to buy those days, I think like a dollar for those so-called drugs dealer burner phone yeah. or the shim cars that inject into the cell phone, which allowed them to communicate their, um, their, you know, their colleagues 12 or plus across Europe and Canada. And they managed to take down the Twin Towers. This not, that's what I call low technology as compared to CIA or FBI, you know, mm. technology, but they managed to do it because their intention, subversive intention is clear. So what are we going to do? The Brooklyn Rail, me and my 14 staffs. So that's what we decided. We're going to, you know, start the Zoom the next day. Swear to God, I call Serena Saad and her partner, Shoja Azari knowing that they are working on a film about a young Iranian, somehow ended up in New Mexico and mm. Nevada, you know, mediating her way through why she's there. So I called them and I asked them to come forth the next day. And that was it. She, she, they came on and since yesterday when we welcomed William Kentridge, it was 278 or nine episodes we've done. And wow. we are until the winter, this winter. So it's very super simple. 
it's like, how do we counter Trump, who's brilliant in deploying speed for power? Yeah. But always great for dictatorial tendency or control to gain power. We know that. I mean, my, my friend, the, the late French philosopher, Paul Liberio, whole entire life is dedicated to studying speed. So I know something about speed, talking to all kinds of friends. And I realized the way to counter Trump and his administration is really to mobilize slowness of culture. That's how we're going to do of the art and humanities and sciences too. Basically what we figured out is the way to do it is to allocate Monday, Tuesday, and Friday to welcome artists, all kinds of discipline to come forward and talk about their work and take as long as possible. You know, when Martin Perrier came on, he talked more than two hours. When Julian Schnabel came on, he talked for three and a half hours. When Noam Chomsky came on, he talked as long, you know? So that's the idea. We realized that we can um, exercise that kind of in-depth conversation about the thing we care for. And then on Wednesday, um, it's allocated for poetry reading. We would invite one poet friend and he or she or they can invite four or five, how many of their friends to read poetry as long as they need to read, you know? And then Thursday is what we call the common ground, which we invite all kinds of political and social activists in different locales across America to talk about voting suppression, talk about immigration, poverty, prison reform, and other social issue. So that's how it started. And we knew we had to do it every day, Helen. And you've kept it up, yeah. And you've, you've kind of continued doing it every day at one o'clock, right, is when it starts? Yeah, because as you know, Trump doesn't drink, nor does drugs, just like Hitler and others. Stalin, I remember reading his biography, you know, mm -hmm. the great biography by um, Stephen Cocking. I mean, I just finished the first volume. It's called Paradox of Power. Uh, there's three volumes. To me, they are great. Well, third one is coming mm. soon. But they are great as Robert Carroll, three volume of uh, LBJ, which I read with great interest. But basically, reading that book, you realize how disciplined he was. He had such aptitude for power. He never drank. He worked from 6 o'clock to midnight seven days a week, you know? So we know those people who consume with power have titanic energy. So mm. how are we gonna counter those titanic energy? So I felt since we created the rail in October, 2000, I knew that was October for the people, not for elite intellectuals, you know? Mm. It had to be for everyone and it's have to stay free. And the rail is really mobilizing the whole community together. It's not an art paper. There's poetry, there's fiction, there's experimental film, there's dance, you know, there's books yeah. and politics, all it together. And that's what we did last year. And we broke our record. It's now more than 2 million readership. That's great. Congratulations. I feel, yeah, I feel like last year I want to say is that in order to match that aptitude, we have to do it every day. Yeah. And we already have the community. So why not bring them together? You know, so now knowing that we can reach all kind of people over the world, you know, last Friday when we welcome Giuseppe Tenone, who doesn't speak English, we didn't care. We just provided a, a translator. So there'll be one channel for Italian readers or audience, and there's one for English audience. Mm -hmm. And we welcome Ai Weiwei, you know, from Portugal. We managed to talk to Peter Brook, who is 97 from Paris. Same thing with Dr. Shiva from outside New Delhi. So we intend to do more of that now onward. So that's, so it's about mobilizing <laughs> slowness against speed. That's, that's a very yeah. clear- reacting, you know, reacting quickly seems very important. Were, yeah. Did anybody else kind of feel like they needed to, to pivot really quickly, turn, turn from you know, a kind of static way of working to a more dynamic way? Or were there any big changes that anybody else kind of like faced that they, um, Mira, I know you started a new job. How was that <laughs> in the middle of a pandemic? Yeah, I can speak to that a little bit. Um, 
I had been I had been working for three years at Art Forum, and then um, towards the start of the pandemic, like over the summer, they laid off about a third of their staff, um, which meant that I had to pivot very quickly and figure out um, what else I would be working on. So I ended up working on a lot more freelance editorial and writing projects, and also specifically um, becoming a lot more focused on a book project that had been underway um, since the year prior, since 2019. Um, about solidarity and feminism in art criticism, um, thinking a lot about some of the structural inequities in art criticism and what are the kind of practical things that writers and editors can actually do to counter those issues. Um, so that's a book project that's still underway, but was a way of um, both trying to figure out kind of how the larger like social political things that we're, that we're dealing with um, touch the field of art criticism or integrate it into the work that we do um, and learning from a lot of other writers and editors about how they grapple with these conditions and what are ways we can kind of work through these to, um, you know, change the way that we work on a daily basis, um, which also influences the kind of larger ways in which we work um, year to year. So that was kind of the, the focus of a lot of my work over the past year. Um, that project is still underway. It's coming out in November with um, Paper Monument, but um, in the last two weeks, I've just started this new role at Art in America as ideas editor. So my work um, is definitely going to change there again. Um, and a primary focus of my work there will be bringing on new writers and trying to really make sure that um, we are, my, my primary focuses are trying to make sure that our writer base is diverse and widespread and that we're covering a wide range of um, venues and artists working across the nation so that we're not just a bi-coastal publication, for example. Mm. Um, so those are some of the things that I've been trying to work on and push for. Well, that kind of leads me into my next question, which, you know, uh, over the past year, we've kind of experienced the events of the day as just people, you know, living through them, but also as writers um, and, and, and having to cover these, these you know, huge events um, through, through journalism, through reporting, through criticism, through comment pieces. How, um, Mira, I'm gonna direct this at you again. How did that kind of experience, you know, influence the kinds of stories that you thought about that you decided to prioritize? Um, how, did, how did that kind of like, you know, how did the personal play into the professional um, for you, you know, as a, as a, as a freelance writer, but also as an editor, you know, commissioning and writing, how do you kind of decide what, what you should cover when mm -hmm. there's so much going on? Right, yeah. Um, I mean, personally speaking, I definitely just had to slow down. Um, I mean, I just the like shifting conditions and um, the, the things that I was dealing with myself meant that I just couldn't publish writing as often as I had before. The writing that I did publish, um, I worked on one piece for an international magazine that was thinking about how um, galleries across North America are responding to um, the widespread protests and social unrest and how they're restructuring the way that they work with artists um, and the way that they operate their space. Like how are they responding to their communities differently? How are they um, changing the ways that artists are able to make a living perhaps from their work? <laughs> so um, that was one, small way again, but um, trying to turn more towards like structural conditions and addressing how spaces are actually trying to change the way they work rather than just, we need to cover, um, you know, more artists who work in X city or something. Um, so definitely, I, I think for me, this manifested in, the, in trying to um, be more focused on these like widespread concerns and structural conditions rather than having more of a narrow focus on the specific artists I might be covering. Great. And, you know, this, this kind of widening of our view of, of what we cover, um, Philip, you know, we had kind of talked about um, how the pandemic changed the areas of art that you looked at. And this could be geographic, but it could also kind of be, you know, the types of art, you know, um, with, you know, with museums kind of doing more digital work, um, that became something that we all suddenly had to you know, pay attention to. Um, how did, how did the pandemic, how did things change for you kind of in, in the areas of art that you covered? You know, 
I think paradoxically, my work became both more publicly focused and then also a lot more private. And it, it seems strange that those two would happen at the same time. Publicly, just because the pandemic meant that we didn't want to go into galleries, a lot of the galleries were closed. I spent a lot of time in public space. I spent a lot of time looking at monuments, memorials, um, squares, parks, the places that people were going, the places that they were kind of recreating during some of the Black Lives Matter and the George Floyd protests. Um, this was happening in Washington, it was happening all across the country. And then it became private too, in that in those early months when we were no longer kind of dictating our schedule by you know, what exhibition is opening on what date and what are the Sunday deadlines, I wrote a lot of stuff that was just about looking at art and what mm -hmm. I thought of art and kind of, kind of grappling with some of the more phenomenological questions of how we experience art as critics. And then finally, I'd say that geographically, we were kind of untethered from the need to be in Washington or New York. You know, the Post had historically always been a very local paper under its more recent ownership. It had expanded and was, was going to New York and we're going to LA. But suddenly with exhibitions online being essentially no different if they were happening in California or if they were happening at the National Gallery, it didn't make any sense not to cover anything that I wanted to cover. So I was covering stuff online in California just as I might cover it in, in Washington. That was great in a lot of ways. There are ups and downs of that. The ups are that it opens up a lot of different institutions to being covered by the Washington Post. The downside is that it meant we were a lot less focused on our own backyard. Did you get a lot of reactions saying, you know, get your focus back on Washington? What are you doing covering stuff in Ohio? Yeah, and that, that's continuing a trend that's going to be hard for us to grapple with. Um, as the Post evolves into a more national, international newspaper, um, there are things that we're not doing that we used to do very regularly. And I don't know what the solution is. We're still trying to figure that out. But yes, we, we've definitely heard from local artists who are wondering, why are you doing a Wayne Thibault show in California when um, this gallery opening two blocks away hasn't been covered? I don't have the answer to that yet. Yeah. But I think we, we actually see a lot of really interesting shows start off in other parts of the country and then come to the coasts and suddenly that's where they get their, you know, all their attention. So I think it's kind of nice for, you know, uh, the Walker Art Center to get first dibs rather than, you know, MoMA. Um, uh, speaking about public art, you know, uh, the public work in the public sphere became so important with galleries closed. Um, and I'm just wondering, you know, uh, if all of you, but Phyllis specifically, if you can kind of start talking about this, um, did you kind of seek out more public art or did your views about public art change? Did you kind of see more of it, you know, in your daily walks um, than you had experienced before? Did you kind of seek it out? Um, I know I personally, my very first kind of, you know, um, uh, meet up with a friend was at the Storm King in the summer, being able to just kind of walk around those hills um, and see a friend after months of not, not seeing them. It was really, really kind of wonderful. Did you, what, what was your kind of view of public art and, and also the kind of debate about public art is so important about who is art for, you know? It, it was much less about public art and it was much, much more personal and emotional. Just how hard it was to get started writing mm. after lockdown. And then um, after I'd watched uh, The Ring Cycle on the Met, I was, I, was so, I was so elated by seeing great art that I was able to start writing again. And I was shocked that it was from opera being streamed, much less that it was Wagner. And then again, um, I mean, public art, then again, there was the problem when George Floyd was murdered. It was hard to write again. And it was astonishing. It wasn't so much memorable public art as seeing all the demonstrators mm. and, and that they were spread out across the city. Um, in my neighborhood, they, uh, I, I caught one march en route to the mayor's house. Uh, one evening, I was having dinner facing the Statue of Liberty at the tip of Manhattan and a demonstration ended up there. 
another time I was in Central Park. And it was more about people than I think it was about public art. The first time I really uh, got to see art during lockdown was when I realized there was a show at Barbara Gladstone that I really wanted to see. And I emailed them and uh, absolutely astonished. They said I could come on Friday or Monday. Um, I went to see Michael Williams' show. They buzzed me in. No one was in the gallery. They left three kinds of hand sign sanitizers out for me. I spent about an hour there. I rolled a chair into the middle of the gallery. And it, it, it was, that was just a personal thrill. So I wish I could talk about public art, but this has just been a very, very personal experience. And I'm very grateful. I listen to Brooklyn Rail a lot. I think um, these one o'clock sessions are one of the godsends of our period. I think the art that's being produced, um, and I'm talking more about gallery shows, the Mary Heilman show that was in Southampton at a pop-up, um, uh, the extraordinary Amy Silman show. I think we're living through an astonishing period that will go in the history books, not just for public art, but for, 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 for private art, for what people have been doing. Yeah. Does, did anybody else kind of have a, you know, kind of really personal experience about art? Did it, did it become suddenly really important to you um, to be able to go see art in some way, um, to have that connection? I, I'll, I'll volunteer, not in particular. Yeah. So uh, Phyllis mentioned the ring cycle and the Met, I, I would endorse that as well. What I've found is that when I go back, I am amazingly vulnerable to art in a way that I have not felt since I was in my 20s. And I don't know if it's simply the absence, if it's the, hi the hiatus um, over the past year, if it's the pent up emotions that's come from it, or if it's the change of status of artists in our society as we've realized that what they do is a genuine kind of public work and a public good. And more people, I think, hopefully recognize that. But now I go back and I have to sort of question myself, have I lost my critical faculties? Am I simply in love with everything that I see the first time? It's probably gonna take several months of the return nothing but nothing but good reviews going forward <laughs> yeah so far <laughs> uh, philip i totally agree with you it has been absolutely astonishing um and and some of it i i i i think has to do with the crowds are gone we get to really enjoy art again um by ourselves or with limited groups and, and, and it's, it's kind of amazing. That does raise the question though, you know, about access to art. Um, we're very privileged in that we can get into these galleries and get into these spaces, you know, um, but shouldn't art be more accessible? Shouldn't, shouldn't there be more availability for people to see great shows, to be able to get into the galleries and have these experiences one-on-one -on -one with art? What do you guys think? Well, I mean, I I would follow what Philip and Phyllis say there. Um, for me, you we just at least for my personal experience, immediately I realized that had the pandemic not happened, I knew that Donald Trump would definitely easily get reelected. So there's a certain kind of slowness that the pandemic had forced us to adapt with that pace. To me, it's a form of healing. Nature needs time to heal herself, her body. That to me is correspond to the way that how we, Philip just talk about how delightful to re-engage in the experience of seeing a work of art and feel it rather than just looking at it analytically speaking. You know, So there was terrible numbers of great show I can't even name any of them. All of them was fresh and new to me, even artists who I knew intimately well. You know, I think Theaster Gate was a great show, a Gagosian. It's opened mm. the dialogue in a deep, deep 
level of social commitment through activism of art. And I think that Serene Nasat and Soja Jari Land of Dreams is a very incredible, thoughtful, sensitive perspective of an immigrant looking in American culture, especially in the Midwest. Um, and even Ham Steinbeck, you know, the, the incredible cryptic intellectualism there based on the vernacular views and intolation um, is equally reminiscent of things that we tend to neglect, you know, from mid-America culture or non-culture. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't know how to articulate all of those artists, but every show I felt I'm confronting for the first time, seeing it for the first time, because it's urgent and it's healing. It's about healing. So it's, um, it's delightful in the same way that, that I would read books now. I read during this past year and a half, more than I have read in my entire last oh. three years, for example. I gone back to reread Alexei de Tocqueville, two volume, 1835-37, you know, the Marx in America. Mm. I went back to read all the volume of, you know, John Dewey, for example, really wanted to understand what he meant by participatory democracy. Yeah philosophical view on art education. Where did he get it from? Emerson, maybe some of the you know, German idealist philosopher as well. So it, it, it's something that I felt like allowing me a sense of really looking at life a little bit differently through the mm -hmm. art and humanity. So that was very useful for me. Uh, as much as keeping up with reading a lot of people's, you know, different perspective, Philip's, um, review of Philip Guston's show, for example, uh, that was very, very uh, thoughtful and, and important, for example. So I just trying to negotiate what you say, Philip, about the private and the public, you know, and both have to be activated in a very urgent and amplifying manner. So it's not about thinking twice about it. You know, you have to think on your feet very yeah. fast. Do and you, I think that's how, how it was for me. Yeah. Do you think um, do you think kind of your readers have had similar kind of feelings about art? Do you think there's been more of an appetite for people um, yes, to read uh, about? Absolutely. Uh, the, the ways in which we know how th that that how many how many people come and read per day. Um, there's way to measure that. But mm. what we did was also to do similarly thing on our Instagram. So our Instagram is a reflecting, a true reflecting reflection of what we do in the, in the rail. Mm. So, so we, for example, we, I, I mentioned on the spot history. Yeah. In the weekend, we invite artists who would share with their, with our audience, what they up to in their studio. So that's is called weekend journal, Saturday and nice. Sunday. During the week, we also trying to get musician to perform. It's called music in transit, sending with poetry in transit. So all of that, even when we go visit, you know, artist studio during the day, yeah, studio, we would post that visit on our Instagram. So Instagram, we are doing the opposite of what Instagram would normally That's do. That's great. So we well, how, how about the rest of you? Have you have you guys had more contact with your readers? Have you been able to take part in you know these kinds of live talks or or have you know kind of more one direct you know feedback from your readers? I see you. I see you nodding, Philip. <laughs> uh, well, I, I, I'll jump in. I mean, I, strangely enough, I feel more closely connected to my readers over this past year than I have in a long time. And I, and I mm. think that in part because um, I was writing a lot more stuff just using the first person, a lot more stuff that was kind of about my relationship to art. Um, and that, that simply appeals to the broad audience for art, who's always looking for, in a sense, permission to, to engage with the critic. Um, <laughs> The other thing is I think that because we were all locked down 
communication felt a little bit more like a private letter arriving to you than it felt like the broadsheet of a newspaper being sold on a public street. There's a way in which everything began to feel much more directly connected. Um, I, I don't know why that is, but just looking at the kinds of email and the volume of email, um, maybe people also had more time in their hands, but I think it, I think it just felt more, more intimate for some reason. Anybody else? Yeah, I would, oh, yeah, I would, okay. This isn't necessarily about readers per se, but I just wanted to like add on to something that Philip was mentioning earlier in terms of um, maybe having a heightened awareness of you know artists as important thinkers too. Um, in terms of um, going to galleries or seeing exhibitions, I also feel like the um, the limitations of viewing art have also meant that um, I've had a lot more one on one conversations with artists um, mm -hmm. and. Also, I had a show of my own work and I had a lot more one-on-one -on -one conversations with people visiting. So I feel like a different kind of um, openness to discussion with artists just for regular people entering the gallery has been heightened in part because of lower attendance generally and in part because of just the social distancing and people I think just craving um, more one-on-one -on -one interaction. So that has been really valuable for me too, just being able to have more conversations directly with people about um, exhibitions that are on view or work that they're making in their studio. Um, and likewise, I've had more virtual studio visits with artists because people are just in a different kind of um, pace with their work. So um, that those... Oh no, you cut out I'm a doing. little mirror. Oh, good. Oh, Go you ahead. Me? Just, yeah, just repeat what you just said before. Okay. Yeah, I was just going to say that those conversations with artists always just renew my investment in what I'm doing. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and what do you think, this is kind of for everyone, whoever wants to jump in first, jump in, but what do you think some of the um, long-term changes will be from the past year? Phyllis, jump right in. You've got well, an idea right away. Well, yeah, because I've been taking notes and I think we went from the world of um, super large galleries, art mm -hmm. fairs, and biennials to a world of pop-ups and streaming and we're we're not going to know what pop-ups and streaming mean for another few months but i think it's critical i think i think uh the biennials that just too much money was spent i think the art fairs too much money was spent and uh a pop-up just gives you a chance to see more, but the pop-ups have not just been established galleries, but a slew of galleries we hadn't expected are now taking root. Do we think that that is something that will be sustained though? Do we think, um, do we think biennials really won't return? at the size they were before or that art fairs, I know Freeze New York is going to be, you know, uh, relaunch, you know, restarting in May on a smaller scale, but do we really think that that's not going to return at a bigger scale or another fair, you know, maybe Basel down the line won't be at a bigger scale as they were before, you know, once, once the pandemic is more under control and, and, and the kind of market forces have their way. Well, I can't predict the future, but I'm certainly hoping that people will um, keep up this slower pace. And um, I mean, just for the sake of sustainability and the environment alone, you know, <laughs> yeah. um, it's completely unsustainable. So, um, you know, I'm also aware of like other kind of organizing that has happened during this period of either artists mobilizing or um, galleries committing to more um, environmentally friendly practices. Like there's various different um, ways of organizing to kind of keep up some of the interest in having um, more healthy uh, relationships to artists and more healthy relationships to labor um, during this period. So obviously a lot of the structural problems that like museums have been um, reported on widely and hopefully are beginning to change. But um, I, I do hope that we'll have wider repercussions for the, the way the rest of the art world works too. Well, I, I feel that whatever that happened, you know, when the Cold War ended in 91, you know, it's very um, incredible event that took place where 
I don't know how many billion, billion dollars <laughs> the, the US government has spent and certainly through CIA operative and all of their incredible global um, operations, so to speak. It just ended. There's no more communism. There's no more Soviet Union. It was a shock when you remember Gorbachev was completely seduced by Reagan ideas and everything else got during that Reaganomic, you know, decade or so. I think that what happened to, to once at least the Democrats and the Republicans share one common enemies, namely Soviet Union Communist Party. And all of a sudden there's no, there's no enemy. There's nothing else to do. I think the whole idea of the culture of, um, you know, lobbyists became very, very prominent where business people, business sector will meet politician, reassuring for the reelection. So politician just became very complacent. They no longer felt the need to go and talk to middle-class American in the suburb. Forget about the working class, poor and rural America, you know? And we all experience it, how incredible arrogant that, you know, Hillary Clinton called those people deplorable. Those are people who ended up in the Congress, you know, in the Capitol. So we understood the implication of what it meant to be neglectful, neglecting people for the longest time. And I just want to point out that Richard Rory's book, um, Achieve in Our Country, it's a very important book, lectures, but more or less, is really dealt deeply into this, you know, high tower of intellectualism, culture, you know, culture, uh, you know, uh, pedestal rather than real politics. It's cultural politics above real politics. Hmm. And we forgot, it's super true. <laughs> where where will we see, I grew up in Vietnam, remember seeing Bob Dylan um, and, you know, John Boyers, and sometimes you see uh, a Jewish poet, gay poet like Allen Ginsberg in a black novelist, also gay, um, you know, um, like James Bowen, along with occasionally see, you know, uh, Marlon Brando, um, Susan Sontag, you know, Irvin Howe, and, and a lot of black and white students protesting yeah. against the war in Vietnam or pro woman liberation, civil rights, of course, which ignite the two movements. And there's none of that happening. We lost our instinct to protest because most of the progressive lab and intellectual gone through the academy. And, uh, you know, now you get two PhD, you wouldn't have a job for you, you know? Yeah. I mean, I'm not sure if we've completely lost our, our instinct to protest. I think um, there's been a lot of that and it's gonna continue, but, um, but I can see what you mean. Um, I'm gonna open it up to audience questions. So um, send them through. We have a couple that kind of relate. So I'm gonna combine them a bit um, from Tom Glenn and from Tom Glenn asks, it seems that the dematerialization of the art object via contemporary perception has been newly embodied in a sense of the desire to see works in the flesh. Um, and then Dana, Dana Klein asks, um, do you anticipate for the future what do you anticipate for the future of exhibition coverage? Will you continue online looking? So it's kind of this, this, um, this dichotomy of seeing work in person versus seeing work online. How does that kind of, how has that, um, how has that kind of changed for you in, during the pandemic? Do you, are you kind of totally used to seeing work online? Do you wanna see more of it in the flesh? Did it convince you even more that you had to be in front of a work of art to really appreciate it? Um, what do you guys think? Phyllis, you're, you're nodding. <laughs> yeah, I mean, uh, uh, seeing art online still sucks. It, uh, that hasn't changed. And, and the joys of, looking at art that can change your life you have to it's not going to change your life looking at it online well i would add also that i think there's been a lot of 
experimentation with different formats of presenting work. Um, and I think some of that will persist. And I think um, it's not necessarily that seeing a painting online is equivalent to seeing a painting in person, but just in terms of um, more like conversations on art or you know online publications or different mm. ways of formatting the ways in which we think about experiencing art. Um, I think some of that is good in the sense that it allows, you know, I tune into conversations that I would never attend in person um, and can see work in some way that I would never see in person. So I expect that some of that would persist even though we can start seeing things in the flesh again, um, because I think on the whole, the consensus seems to be that it's not equivalent, but there are some advantages or good things that have emerged from being forced to try out different formats. Great. Um, we have a question from Jill W. Do you think that art criticism will proceed with new voices? Can daily newspapers afford to keep on critics when the newspaper industry is turning to new, new models for survival? I think this is a very relevant question for all of us um, and a very tough one. Um, what do you guys think? Is, is this, you know, there is definitely a need for new voices um, covering art critically, um, you know, uh, and, and, having having that kind of presence maintained um but the reality of it you know um with newspaper budgets kind of shrinking and advertising revenue um you know struggling how did how does that happen how does that kind of get maintained <laughs> well I, I can jump into somebody who writes for a newspaper yeah. i'm i'm in a, a fortunate situation i'm writing for a newspaper that is actually financially fairly healthy um, that's not the case for the vast majority of newspapers around the country. So um, I worry very much that local newspapers, local critics um, are going to have to find other, other ways, other platforms, other means of making a living. Um, it's very clear that the conversation about race and inclusion is, is at every institution. You know, we've, seen, we've seen controversies at the New York Times. Those have been a little less ostentatious at the Washington Post, but they're there as well. And we're certainly keenly aware that we need to diversify the voices that we have writing on art right now. There's the hope because the paper is healthy that perhaps that means hiring more people. Um, that's been the response in other departments and I hope it extends to the department that writes about the arts as well. Pong, how about you? You're, you're a publisher. This is right in your wheelhouse. How do you make sure that you kind of maintain well, these? Well, I mean, I think that from the outset, I was very aware of the history of independent publication, you know, whether beginning with Marx's Quarterly, Partisan Review, or other art magazine, you know, View Magazine, for example, you know, there are, there were a lot were supported by CIA, although the content was terrific. I mean, I was aware of even the seven art, which existed one year, 1916 to 17, uh, 10 issue, uh, which with its short lived inspired the rail. You know, that's why we cover the seven arts from the very beginning. But I also knew that we have to keep it free. That's a very important thing, which is very much antithesis to how we're gonna be able to um, motiv motivate people who would support what we do, foundations and whatnot, and you know, all the potential donors. It's been a very challenge, challenging 20 years, but I must say this past year, especially uh, the Artist Foundation have stepped up in a very prominent way not that they haven't before, but it just they just did it even more so than they ever before, namely William de Kooning Foundation, for example. Um, you know, Frank and Toller Foundation, the same, and Richard Pusher Dot Foundation. In a way, it occurred to me more clearer than I ever thought, because those early artists, you know, they their worldview was very integrated with the community. You know, when you talk about even Gustin Philip, you know, you, 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 um, I think your review of his show, the Philip collection was particularly good because it's focused on his relationship with the poets, you know, also. 
and and I think that that important when when the whole entire community is all part of the dialogue, so they understood that what we're trying to do with the rail. Do you know what I mean? So there's dance, there's performance, there's poetry. Uh, Guston without the poet would be really not the same. You know, uh, you when you think about even up to the to certain generation like Richard Sarah or John Jonas. I don't think that Richard would have became the sculpture he is had not been for spending so much time with the experimental filmmaker, namely people like Michael Snow or Yvonne Rayner, or having spent so much time going to Justin Church dance. When you think about how those dancers refused to perform on the stage, they mm. wanted to bring dance on the floor, not associating with Martha Graham or European ballet, modern ballet, so to speak. That's inspired by living theater, you know? So when you think about Richard eliminating the, the pedestal, it's very similar idea that already been materialized among those dancers. Mm -hmm. So not to mention music and, you know, experimental music scene. So I think for me is very simple. I think it's going to be, we're going to see more artist foundations it's going to step up and be more generous. I think the whole idea of philanthropy will radically change. I think people from very famous foundation without naming anyone will begin to pay attention to small living organism like the rail and you know similar hmm. publication or nonprofit whether artist space or ontology film archives you know, printed matter, uh, those are places that need support greater, greater support. And I think they're gonna pay attention to, to those organization and pay visit too. We're talking about site visit that never been implemented or <laughs> activated for a, several decades now, you know? Mm -hmm. So, you know, I think we're gonna see different things, radical change in the public. We well, I'll definitely keep out, keep keep my eye out for those generous foundations, um, handing out grants. That's that would definitely be helpful. I think. Um, one more question from Astyaj Baj Bass: um, Do you think about new unexpected venues um, to see work in community centers, university art galleries? Did you kind of go outside of the usual, you know, commercial gallery? Um, big museum scene to kind of see art. Did you, um, I, I'm gonna share a little personal um, anecdote. Uh, I spent a lot of the pandemic in Massachusetts um, helping my elderly parents and, um, uh, you know, on Cape Cod. And, uh, and I, one of my kind of uh, big excursions, you know, kind of hikes was going out to see the artist dune shacks in P-Town where a lot of artists kind of lived, um, which was an incredible kind of, it was an incredible hike and it was just kind of nice, to think, amazing to see this slice of history um, kind of standing in the, in the middle of, of these completely bizarre landscape, um, which I probably wouldn't have done, you know, if I didn't have the time and the kind of inclination to go out looking for it. Um, was there anything like that where you guys kind of went down and trekked and found something new that you wouldn't have normally kind of come across before? I think not so much in terms of my own writing, but in terms of, um, you know, working as an editor, I think uh, I'm definitely trying to be more expansive in terms of the things that we consider covering, um, especially when it comes to smaller art communities and other cities. Um, being able to cover, Helen, as you were mentioning earlier, like being able to cover the exhibition at its first venue before it goes to the big museum in New York or LA. Um, that feels really important to recognize um, the work of curators and artists in smaller communities or being able to cover an artist earlier in their career before they start working um, or exhibiting at larger spaces. So um, just in terms of like, in a social and political sense, that feels really important to be able to um, attend to artists and exhibitions um, before they come to us here. <laughs> Hello, Brooke. Does anyone, we... else, does anyone else want to respond to that question before? Uh, can I just very quickly respond? Uh, Please. I, 
discovered an artist in Washington I had not known. Um, she created a noose out of vines and hung it on her porch and suddenly it became a story that was a political story. And mm -hmm. I uh, called her up and had an astonishing conversation with her and found that I had not known her work. It was a rich body of work, uh, mm -hmm. smart. And she never really entered into the gallery system that I was aware of, um, mm. and Bowie. And uh, it would not have happened if it were not for the social, um, the social uh, turmoil, the uh, opening of, of minds and the pandemic, which kind of said all, all bets are off, all rules are, are suspended for the moment. Mm. That's a great yeah, example. I, I just want to add one last thing um, is that the urgency of experienced work of art um, is really a way to associate and amplify our respond to concerning to beauty. You know, I think the word aesthetics seem to be different than we prior thought about what it meant. It just it just means that it's the opposite of anesthetic. Anesthetic, which means temporary loss of sensation or the state of polarisis or amnesia. And I think that aesthetic amplification means you've been alert. You, your sense of awareness got more amplified, I feel, now than ever. You know, so to me, that's also associating with hopefully if we can re deploy somehow the way that the art of humanity was so effective during the Great Depression through the Federal for the Arts. You know, I always love Eleanor Roosevelt when she say, never mistake the difference between knowledge and wisdom. For one is helping you to make a living, but the other is helping you to make a life. And I think we are going through the similar period right now just associating with Joe Biden with her same way with, if we think of Biden being the oldest American president, if that is, and he's slow, as you remember, Trump called him Sleepy Joe. If he's slow, slowness proven to be an amazing arsenal against Trump's deployment of speed. No more, no less than FDR who have a handicap. He had polio, remember? So I think there are some similar, uh, you know, polarity there. It just now is up to us how to mobilize our community together. And I think if the art and humanity plus the science community has been incredible marginalized for so long because they all went to pharmaceutical company or the academy, they no longer part of the public dialogue. If you can bring them together, I think we have a great chance to restore some serious democracy, fragile democracy. That's a wonderful way to conclude um, Fong and Fong and Mira, Philip, Phyllis, Helen, thank you for such um, a wonderful conversation today, talking about the deeply personal act of looking um, and seeing with refreshed eyes that this period has brought out. Um, we're grateful for, for your insights in, in talking about your work um, and, and this time that we're all living through. And I hope all of the listeners on Zoom will continue um, to read what you write extensively. So um, thank you all. Our, just so I can tell you, our next project in Madison Square Park is Maya Lin's Ghost Forest that opens next month. And I hope that you'll all um, come to see an incredible haunting and, and stunning work. Um, thank you for joining us today and participating. Thank you, Brad. Stay well. Much thank love you. and courage.